So today we're going to talk about evaluation of non-cardiac chest pain and whether it really is an esophageal spasm. So this is just a brief overview of my talk. We're going to be talking about definitions, ideology, and pathophysiology, evaluation, and treatments of non-cardiac chest pain. So, you know, this is just a sample case. You have a 40-year-old man with past medical history of anxiety, diabetes, obesity, presents to your clinic with intermittent esophageal spasms. I think we've all seen this in our clinic before, right? Someone literally comes to you into the clinic and tells you, I think I have esophageal spasms. So we're gonna talk about what to do with that. So he reports, you know, it's worth, the symptoms are worse with eating, no dysphagia, cardiac workup, of course, negative. So I just want you to keep the sample case in mind and as we go through, you know, this next side, um, the, next few slides, you know, or go, go through the rest of the slides, kind of keep in mind how you would evaluate and treat this gentleman. So the definition for non-cardiac chest pain is pretty simple. You have recurrent chest pain and a cardiac source has been excluded. The prevalence of non-cardiac chest pain is very common, has a global prevalence of 13%, up to 30% of patients, um, and up to 30% of patients with chest pain. For esophageal-related causes of non-cardiac chest pain, there are really three major causes. So gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, which exists in about 50 to 60% of patients, functional chest pain, which exists in about 30 to 35% of patients, and esophageal motility disorders, which exists in about 15 to 30% in the literature. I, I think even this number is an overestimation, but we'll talk about that in the future slides. Prevalence in men and women are about the same. There's higher prevalence in younger patients and lower prevalence in less developed countries. So there are, these are, there are a lot of comorbidities that's associated with non-cardiac chest pain, so including anxiety, depression, panic disorder, stress, poor sleep, and childhood adversity. So, you know, these central factors are thought to potentially enhance esophageal perception to any type of stimulus, so that includes acid, includes fluid, um, so you'll see this as common comorbidities. So kind of going to, you know, what are, what are, tools, diagnostic tools that we have to help us figure out what is the cause of this patient's non-cardiac chest pain. So we'll start off with the tools that can help us answer the question whether this patient may have GERD that's causing it, right? Because GERD is the most common cause. So I think, you know, all of us probably start off with this step, which is doing a PPI trial if it hasn't been done already. And this has been, you know, back, well backed by data, systematic review, where they use usually at least 50% symptom reduction during PPI treatment as an endpoint has shown, you know, good sensitivity of 89% and 88% specificity in predicting GERD as a cause of non-cardiac chest pain. Uh, there was a small study done by Kim et al. using ribiprazole 20 milligrams twice a day. Um, it was a non-controlled trial, but you know the main point from this is that in this study, it showed that they only saw a significant difference in PPI response between the GERD versus non-GERD patients only starting in the second week. So if you're using a you know, kind of a short PPI test as a diagnostic test, just to get a sense, is there an acid-related component to the problem? You know, the recommendation is that you should do the PPI trial for at least two weeks. There's a little bit of different terminology in, in the studies out there, but, you know, there's also, so there's PPI test, which is kind of, you know, minimum two weeks, kind of used as a diagnostic test. And then there's empiric PPI therapy, where we generally use double dose PPI over two months. And this is still considered kind of the best initial therapeutic approach for what you or possibly GERD-related non-cardiac chest pain. Um, among all the studies that's been done, omeprazole is still the most commonly used PPI in trials, although other PPIs have also demonstrated equal efficacy. So in terms of data, there's really no data showing one PPI is better than the other. So just pick your favorite one and use it. Uh, what are some other diagnostic tools that we have? So we can do pH testing with symptom association. Among pH tests, you have your choice of wireless pH capsule. Um, so this is generally more comfortable for patients. It's more sensitive in documenting symptom association with reflux events compared to 24-hour catheter-based pH tests. Um, and then we also have our more traditional catheter-based pH test, which you can do with or without impedance. So the purpose of impedance is, you know, it really helps you 
to detect non-acidic reflux events or weakly acidic reflux events that the wireless pH capsule may not be able to pick up. But just of note, in patients with non-cardiac chest pain, there really is very limited data on the value of adding impedance. So because the role of non-acidic reflux, uh, uh, non-acidic reflux in inducing chest pain is still unclear. So PPI trial has been shown to be at least as sensitive as 24-hour pH testing, and you should consider pH testing in definitely people who you are thinking about sending for anti-reflux surgery um, or in patients with equivocal or negative PPI trials, so if they didn't have that robust response to a PPI test. Uh, higher acid exposure time on pH testing does correlate with the degree of PPI response in patients with GERD-related non-cardiac chest pain. So what about in using endoscopy as a diagnostic tool? So the thing to note is that um, there will be a lower prevalence of objective findings of GERD uh, in non-cardiac chest pain pa patients compared to patients with more traditional reflux symptoms. So this chart here is a breakdown. You know, this was a study done looking at about 3,700 non-cardiac chest pain patients and their endoscopic findings. So you'll see that, you know, 44% of the patients were normal, 29% just had a hiatal hernia, 19% um, had esophagitis. But as you know, the th important thing to know also is LA grade C and D are definitive evidence of GERD, right? Whereas LA grade A and B are not. So, you know, really, if we're talking about definitive evidence of GERD, that percentage is going to be even less than 19%. And then Barrett's peptic stricture, these are definitive evidence of GERD, and that existed for 4% for each. Uh, among these patients, eosinophilic esophagitis, if you use the standard of uh, the definition of eosinophils, at least 15 per high power field, uh, exists in about 12% of these patients. Generally, barium swallow is not recommended for as a diagnostic tool for GERD. So let's say you think that this person has GERD-related non-cardiac chest pain. How do you treat it? How do you, how, you know, how do you treat it? So definitely you have your choice of anti-reflux medications, PPI therapy, H2 blockers. Baclofen and Gaviscon have not been specifically studied for non-cardiac chest pain, um, but uh, you know, definitely they're safe. They can be effective. You can definitely feel free to use it. Um, and then, you know, if medications are not helping, then you, know, you have your options for fundoplication treatment. So there's endo endoscopic treatment, transoral incisionless fundoplication, which has limited data in specifically GERD-related non-cardiac chest pain, um, but something that you can consider. And then most of the data for surgery in GERD-related non-cardiac chest pain is really um, uh, for fundoplication is surgical. So most of the data is on Nissen fundoplication. And that has shown 48 to 96 percent um, patient improvement with chest pain resolution. And prior response to PPI therapy, higher symptom association scores have all predicted greater symptom resolution and higher satisfaction scores. So moving onwards to esophageal dysmotility. So this is the least common cause of non-cardiac chest pain. Um, it has been reported in the literature. So the, the gold standard way of detecting esophageal dysmotility is high resolution esophageal manometry. And that's been um, reported to be abnormal in 15 to 30% of patients with non-cardiac chest pain. Um, but you know, the thing to note is that the relationship between motor abnormalities and chest pain actually also still remains unclear. And you know, especially when we do a lot of esophageal mon manometries, we see this quite often, is that these patients rarely have chest pain at the time these motility abnormalities are recorded. So. Um, just because you see an abnormality doesn't necessarily mean that that's the cause of their symptoms. So this was one of the bigger studies looking at esophageal dysmotility in non-cardiac chest pain patients. So this study had about 140 patients, and this was really where that 30% number came from. So in this study, 30% of the patients had reported, were, was found with esophageal motility abnormalities. The thing to note is that for this study, this was done before the day 
days of the, the Chicago classification. So um, that didn't exist at that time. So this was the actual breakdown among those 30% of patients with esophageal motility, uh, motility abnormalities. This was the specific breakdown. And you know what counted as an esophageal motility disorder, um, you know, they, they they counted hypotensive lower esophageal sphincter, hypertensive lower esophageal sphincter, um, and also this kind of mixed bag group of nonspecific esophageal motility disorder. And these would not actually be considered major motility disorders under our current Chicago classification. So if you actually looked at the actual numbers and you only counted major motility disorders under kind of the current Chicago classification, so, you know, and I, I was pretty liberal here in terms of the categories that I included, so achalasia, nutcracker esophagus, uh, diffuse esophageal spasm, and I even included the ineffective peristalsis. Um, this only made up of about 5.7% of this group of patients, so really much lower than the 30%. So if you do have, if you did find an esophageal dysmotility that you think is causing the chest pain, um, generally treatment that's available to you are smooth muscle relaxants. Um, generally for all of these things, the studies are very small. We're talking about like five to 20 patients, okay? So these are not large randomized control studies, but um, you know, peppermint is something that you can use. Peppermint is a natural antispasmodic, so the goal is for it to coat the esophagus. So you can ask patients to buy some peppermint Altoids, suck on it so that it coats the esophagus. They can ingest some peppermint oil. Um, nitrates have been studied with mixed results. Calcium channel blockers uh, in include diltiazem, nifedipine. Um, so these are options to you. They have been studied in uh, spastic esophageal disorders like nutcracker esophagus, diffuse esophageal spasms. Uh, diltiazem's data is a little bit better, but again, studies are very small. Phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors such as sildenafil has not, ha has not been specifically studied for non-cardiac chest pain, um, but sometimes we do use it clinically. And uh, benzodiazepines have actually shown symptom improvement in chest pain, in non-cardiac chest pain patients, but these were very old studies, and as we all know, it comes with its own kind of set of adverse effects, dependency, so generally clinically nowadays, this is not one of our go-to treatments. Endoscopic treatments are also available. So generally we're, you know, we're talking about these spastic esophageal disorders, right? So Botox injection has been studied in uh, distal esophageal spasm, nutcracker, hypertensive, lower esophageal sphincter patients, and generally the studies have all shown improvement in chest pain. Bougie dilation was actually also studied uh, in spastic esophageal disorders. Interestingly, there was no difference in chest pain compared to placebo, but there was actually an overall decrease in that study in chest pain in both groups, which actually indicates significant placebo response. POEM has been studied in a multiple case series for spastic esophageal motility disorder and uh, has, been, has shown improvement in chest pain up to 91% of patients. I think the difficult thing with POEM is kind of knowing how extensive the myotomy should be, how long that cut should be, because, you know, if generally for these spastic esophageal disorders, let's say distal esophageal spasm, you know, jackhammer esophagus or hypercontractile esophagus, that spastic segment involves the entire esophageal smooth muscle. So if you go and cut the entire esophageal smooth muscle, you're essentially converting them from one major motility disorder to another motility, major motility disorder, which is absent contractility. So it's just something to be thoughtful about and be careful about. Surgical myotomy has also been studied. There was a small case series of uh, Heller myotomy with fundoplication and distal esophageal spasm patients that have shown resolution of chest pain to be as high as 94%. So let's say you eliminate all of that, you know, what's left is functional chest pain. This is the Rome 4 diagnostic criteria for functional chest pain. So the patient has to meet all of the following criteria um, with symptom happening, uh, symptom frequency happening at least once a week, retrosternal chest pain or discomfort, cardiac causes have been ruled out, absence of associated esophageal symptoms such as heartburn, dysphagia, absence of uh, evidence that GERD or eosinophilic esophagitis is the cause of symptom, and absence of major esophageal motor disorders. 
And like with most of the other Rome 4 diagnostic criteria, they have to fulfill criteria for the last three months with symptom onset at least six months before diagnosis. Um, you know, clinically, remember Rome 4 is really was really developed for research purpose, recruiting patients. So it's gonna be a little bit more stringent, right, for patient selection. So, you know, I think clinically, this is a great guideline to work off of, but you know, if someone doesn't meet all of these criteria exactly, you know, you can still go based on your kind of, you know, clinical sense. There's a variety of treatment options available for functional chest pain. Um, just starting off with the most natural therapy, so you have your complementary and alternative medicine options. All of these things have been studied in uh, functional chest pain. So this includes cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnotherapy, coping skills training, even energy he healing and biofeedback. And all of these things have shown to be beneficial in, in functional chest pain. Other treatments include psychological treatments, addressing sleep deprivation, and of course, neuromodulator therapy. So this is just a summary of a list of your pain modulator options that's available to you for treatment of functional chest pain. So, you know, you have your classes of tricyclic antidepressants, SSRIs, SNRIs, trazodone, and some other medications that we probably use less often, theophylline, gabapentin. But these have all been studied in non-cardiac chest pain patients. I would still, and generally, as you can see from this chart here, you know, generally the response is pretty decent, you know, 50 to 60% response um, across the classes. I would say the choice of pain modulators is a little bit nuanced, um, but, you know, kind of the, the major classes that we use really is still the tricyclics, SNRIs, and SSRIs. Really how you determine kind of which class to go for depends on the patient. It, it really has to be individualized to the patient. So, you know, if, you're, if your patient has you think there's like a, you know, uncontrolled anxiety, there's a central component that's really clearly driving their esophageal hypersensitivity and functional chest pain, and that anxiety is uncontrolled, then you should consider starting an SSRI or SNRI to kind of help with that. But if this person maybe is already on an SSRI for their anxiety, their anxiety is well controlled, or they don't have much anxiety, they don't have much of that central component that's driving the functional chest pain, or let's just say they have insomnia, then a tricyclic and a low dose tricyclic antidepressant would be a great option. Because, but you know, a low dose tricyclic antidepressant is not going to at fifty at fifty milligrams or lower is not going to have a central mood effect. So. These are kind of some of the guiding principles in how you can choose your pain modulator. So just to put it all together, think back on that 40-year-old patient that you know you saw at the beginning of the case. So you know this patient is in your clinic with non-cardiac chest pain. You want to kind of ask about alarm symptoms. You know if the, he has alarm symptoms, of course you're going to do an upper endoscopy, treat any mucosal abnormality that you see, and then if they don't have alarm symptoms, you're going to go on to doing a PPI test or a of at least two weeks or empiric PPI trial lasting two months. If they have a positive response to the PPI trial, you're gonna assume that this is probably GERD-related non-cardiac chest pain. You can do your step-down approach to find the lowest therapeutic GERD therapies. If they didn't have a robust response or didn't have any response to the PPI trial, um, you have kind of two options. If you haven't already done an EGD, you should probably do one and to take a look and again, treat any mucosal abnormality. Um, and uh, if you already did an upper endoscopy, you should consider doing pH testing off of PPI to really answer the question, do you truly have GERD or not? If, that, if the pH test is positive, you can add on further uh, you know, GERD therapies. That includes baclofen, which reduces transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, alginate therapy, such as Gaviscon, which kind of has a barrier effect. Um, you can consider endoscopic and surgical therapy. And I always say these things don't necessarily always exist independently of each other, right? You can have someone with GERD and also have someone with esophageal hypersensitivity. And you know you can also consider using a pain modulator in these patients. If the pH test is negative for GERD, you can consider doing esophageal manometry. And if that shows a motility disorder or a spastic motility disorder that you think could be causing symptoms, you can consider the treatment options of smooth muscle relaxants, Botox, POM, or surgery. And lastly, if that's also negative, you know, I, we're, you're thinking about dealing, you're 
working with functional chest pain, then these are kind of the treatment modalities that's available to you, pain modulators, psychological treatments, and complementary alternative medications. So take home points, non-cardiac chest pain is actually most commonly caused by GERD, frequently caused by functional chest pain, and really least frequently caused by esophageal motility disorder. So if someone walks into your clinic saying they have esophageal spasms, it's probably not that. Um, multiple pathophysiology can be contributing to pain, and uh, PPI test or trial is an effective first step. If doing an endoscopy, I would recommend you taking biopsies for eosinophilic esophagitis to rule that out. Um, I encourage you to think carefully before sending a patient with a non-achalasia, spastic, or hypercontractile motility disorder for a, a irreversible intervention like a myotomy. Just, you know, kind of think carefully about whether you really think this is causing their symptoms. And also consider pain modulators if you think there's a component of esophageal hypersensitivity. That's it. Thank you.